request that we turn on the air conditioning in here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it feels the same way. So, okay. How many of you were here last night? How many of you were not here last night? Okay, I see a face back there. A Christian a friend of mine who came down to the lake, so thank you. Duh. Yes. Um, so I will kind of summarize a little bit and review just to get all of our brains back on track and then tell you a little bit about where I'm going to meet. And then we will head into new territory, exploring exciting new things, okay? And how many of you have read some or all of this? I should have like a prize for who. Uh, I know a lot of people like, oh, I kind of read it, I kind of read it, and then, you know, so if you've got, how many people have read it to the very last page? <laughs> okay, well, this series is on the three main sections of this book, Reading the Bible of Rabbi Jesus. I have been writing about the first century context of Jesus for 20 years. Uh, at least I've been studying, I haven't maybe been writing that long, but I've been studying about it and I've been sharing all these ahas. Oh, that makes so much more sense. And so you can see that's what I'm putting into this book is I'm trying to give you new tools to unlock some of those mystifying passages that are just to clear away the smog and, the, and all of those things and push wipe the dust away from history. Okay, that's what we're working on. And you might think, because it says Rabbi Jesus, that it's just only specifically about Jesus's Jewishness. But what I kept finding when I was doing my research about his context is that a lot of things that were helpful that were about his Jewishness were a little broader than that. It's not just Jewish people who think like that. It's Middle Easterners in general. It's actually, oh, it, when, when I got to know some folks from China who were studying this, they said, this makes so much more sense to Chinese. Like, Why would you? <laughs> and then I told stories about my friends from Uganda, Ugandan pastors who joined our Torah study, it's where we were reading through the Torah, which sounds kind of crazy. Um, but within a few weeks, they were fascinated, and they thought, oh, this totally makes sense. This is, this is how we think of Uganda. And so I kept hearing these voices, and, and as I kept reading and studying, I kept finding all the <laughs> ways that people approach life that are not always the way Americans do. And so that's <laughs> uh, And it's not so much I need to share that with you, but some of these motifs are especially helpful in how we understand, helping us understand our Bible. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight, how the Bible thinks. And uh, I said last night that, by the way, I'm getting this echo. That's okay. I'm just waiting for something to squeal. Can you, can you back for me? Yeah. Okay, just a tad. I just feel like I'm going to okay. say something loudly and then it's going to <laughs> is you know a lot of people say oh i need to think more biblically about that and and they mean lovingly and full of grace and i'm actually not using it in that sense i don't mean i mean like an ancient hebrew and sometimes that isn't necessarily the nicest most huggy way of thinking but that's okay <laughs> because we're going to think Try to put our brains into their brains. Maybe I can start with a, a story. Um, well, there's this there's a classic sermon that's based on a line from Exodus where God tells Moses to go up to the mountain <coughs> and be there. Literally, in the Hebrew, it says, 
Vayihishon, be there. And in English, if you read it word for word, it doesn't quite make sense. But that's the kind of thing that rabbis like to write sermons about. And they said, ah, yes. What this can teach us is that there is such a thing as traveling to a distant place, coming to a momentous occasion, and yet having one's thoughts completely consumed with everything else in their lives and not really being there. And so what, you know, literally, I think if God was just saying, go up to the mountain and stay there or remain there. That's how the translators do. But the take on this great sermon was, if we want to hear the Lord speaking to us, we need to cut off distractions. We need to involve ourselves fully and ask the Lord, what are you saying? And be open to hearing the Bible speaking its own way. And being there to empathize with the people. Last night we were talking about that you kind of need to put your, I guess, you walk in their shoes a while and consider uh, what it was like if people are not wealthy and they don't have food to eat and all those kinds of things. So that's what we've been talking about. And tonight we're going to go down a couple themes um, about how the Bible thinks. <laughs> and can you see through my podium? I'm going to scoot this over just to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, a word from our sponsor. Or if you want to keep talking. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I got you all excited and then I but that's what my slide made me go. So, but you know, if you're on fire, we give you more resources. Um, okay. Can the second one change as the order? Yeah, this is our my new okay. website. I, I made this new one. Uh, my old one is. Uh, EGRC.net. This one is my new one. Okay, so I'll tell you more later if you like. That's different. Okay. And I'm just reviewing just to remind you that I was saying how, in some ways, our problems with the Bible is not when we, things that don't make sense to us, is sometimes it's not so much that the Bible is so strange in its cultural ways, but actually it's because modern technological Americans approach to life is unusual compared to much of the world over much of history and that approach like the same as we do. Ooh, let me, and so that's what we're talking about. And so the researchers came up with an acronym to describe the ways that people in our culture are most different than other people. And they call it weird. We're a little weird. And so we're Western, we're going to talk about that tonight. Educated, we come from societies where we have lots of technology. We go to jobs every day instead of growing uh, crops and fishing. And, uh, and we are relatively wealthy. So we don't have the same cares in life that everybody else does. And we live in societies that are very egalitarian, that that have democratic elections. It makes us look at life differently than in traditional societies where you have hierarchy or where you have more we honor so and so and we honor so and so. We're going to talk about that a lot more tonight. Okay. So, and that's where we're going. Okay, but first I'm going to do an experiment. This is a and that this is not just social science. This is an experiment. I, and I, okay, we're going to now. You're going to mentally imagine you are not at a religious seminar right now. I know that we're in a shopping mall right now, right? Okay, mentally you are 20 feet away in the hall, and all of the people around you are people you've never met before, but you are supposed to get to know each other. You introduce yourselves to each other. Okay, for the next. Five minutes, introduce your, how do you introduce yourselves? Go for it. 
You go ahead. I'm and I, whatever you, right? And that, you know, the very first question that you ask is, what do you do meaning? What's your profession? And, uh, and your answer is, I'm CEO of Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you derive your identity, right? That's how you define yourself. And maybe if you spent maybe just a little longer, you might say, um, and I have a hobby of, I love stamp collecting. I'm into stamp collecting. He says, oh, you do. and so you talk about your personal interests. Okay, okay so that's your, that's how we would introduce ourselves. We, that's how we define ourselves to someone else. Like, right? when we're trying to get to know each other. Well, I want to share with you those of you who haven't read it yet in the book, it's on page 118, how two Somali men might get to know each other. And uh, I read this in a, a biographer or a reporter who he wrote a book called The Shadow of the Sun. Who said he had traveled extensively in Africa and he said, uh, he says, the Somali is born somewhere on the road in a shack tent or directly in the open <laughs> sky, he has but a single identity. It's determined by his ties to family, to the kinship, kinship group, to the clan. When two strangers meet, they start by asking, who are you? I am Soba, the first one begins, from the family of Abdul, Ab, Ahmed Abdullah, which belongs to the Musa Ariye group, which is from the clan of Hassim Said, which is part of the larger, larger East Ak clan. And the, the second stranger gives the particulars of his lineage. And the exchange lasts a very long time and is immensely important because both individuals are trying to determine whether something unites them or divides them, whether they should embrace or attack each other with knives. <laughs> <laughs> their personal rapport, their mutual symp sympathy or antipathy have no meaning. Their relationship, be it friendly or hostile, depends on the current state of affairs of their family, between their two clans. The human being, the singular distinct person does not exist, or he matters only as a part of this or that. 
that's kind of extreme. I, I would say that's very extreme, at least from my perspective, and maybe he's a little bit pushing it to the edge there. But yet, just even that he could even describe somebody that way makes me say, wow, could this be helpful anyway? And one way I check is I ask other people, and I ask my Uganda friends when they read that, oh yeah, that's exactly what we do. <laughs> Maybe not the fight with knives, but they, there is very much a, you're, who you are is which tribe you are. There's a very strong sense of tribe. <coughs> and when you meet somebody, your status is who you are, and, and, that, and how are your, your families getting along with each other. That's what people think about. So that's how Soba would introduce himself. And so now I'm, I'm just trying to help us just see if we can just shift our minds. I'm not really trying to say, and you need to think more like this. I'm just trying to help you empathize with people who might think like this. Okay. So, okay. And you can see that one big part of that is he cares more about his family than he cares about himself. Sure, that the guy he meets might like stamp collecting too, or maybe he doesn't. Maybe you like the same kind of spears. It doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> it's about the family. It struck me that even though this sounds absolutely kind of crazy to us, but actually in one sphere of our life, we actually do kind of still do this, and that's in the corporate world. It, um, imagine the the CEO of Pepsi and the, you know, the general manager of Coca-Cola meet. You know, they might, they might say, boy, he looks like fun, and we could go and shoot the breeze, go to a football game. And the, the status of their corporation defines whether they're friends or enemies, whether they are, have mutual antipathy or not. And so in some ways, you can kind of understand this fellow's attitude about my family is my identity in the same way as if you're part of a, a corporation and in charge and part of a, that it's like an artificial family status that you've taken on and that's kind of the way people think. You could say he's working for his family corporation. <laughs> so, this is, so this is part of my thinking tonight. I have to say this took a lot of mental energy is to try to even empathize with because we're so hard baked on individualism you know oh achieve your dreams <laughs> what do i personally want to do with my life you know go out strike it on your own this is the way we are wired our our life our our whole being is oriented towards our individual welfare, right? Okay. And, and anything different from that sounds to us just horrible because we've heard many, many stories about, oh, the, we think of workers in a great factory where they're all just drones walking and, you know, repressed and, you know what, there has been a ton of abuses in the world. And so, yeah, there's a reason why people don't like that. So, yes, and yet somehow this has been working for a lot of people. And, oops, okay. This is another quote from the same writer about Africa. He said, individualism is highly prized in Europe. In Africa, it's synonymous with unhappiness. Okay. Here, and uh, once again, I applied it to the corporate world. If, if you define yourself in your job, and your job is your relationship with a company, if you don't have a relationship with a company, that would mean that you're unemployed. You're unemployed. <laughs> Doesn't that say... Isn't that kind of a, I'm a failure in life. I'm unemployed, right? Because our status is part of that. Okay, so how do they think? This is 
and I'm trying to get myself in my brain, what do they think like? Welcome to the team. When a new baby is born, like, yay, you joined our team. Uh, not, oh, look, I wonder what dreams you'll have and what you decide to become. <laughs> it's not like, yay. Okay. Your family, we, are, we love each other so much. We, and your orientation is towards how much you 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 appreciate and honor these great ancestors of yours who gave you life and defined you and okay how many of you have seen fiddler on the roof well lenny not everybody but you know that song that kevya sings this is tradition tradition and so i thought of i i, I was asking what's the personality type here among the audience and i think i've got You've got some people, people who still sing out of the old, old hymnals and they like the songs the way we always sang them. And then you've got your folks who are really into new stuff and cool, it's new, right? It's relevant. And you get sort of the heretics. <laughs> and then you've got the ones at the very uh, over the top, is you've got your teenagers where it's Facebook, memes, and everything. Ooh, it's fun. It's new for the next half hour. It's a new thing. New, new, new. And ooh, I'm very impressed with that new, new thing. Do you remember in Athens when Paul, the, uh, Paul goes to Athens and the, the comment is where everybody is talks about the new thing all the time. And we say, what? That's normal. But this obsession with novelty isn't a, a normal way of life in a place where you're very defined by incredibly wonderful traditions. It's just not a same, very different way of thinking. Okay. And another part of this is uh, often you talk about these cultures as honor shame cultures. There's been a, a quite an interest in that motif. What it means is is the way you frame yourself and what you should do is how does this honor and glorify my family? Or if I've done something wrong, do I feel guilty that God himself is mad at me? Or does it bother me more that my family might be embarrassed by what I've done? And uh, so uh, one, I, I mentioned one resource yesterday is called, called um, Born to Familiar, great little book. Uh, the woman who wrote that, I have met her, but she, it's a, she tells great stories and uh, she's traveled the world and interacted a lot. She was telling about when she lived in Amsterdam, that she was walking along the street and some <coughs> Arab young youths uh, felt like they're gonna kinda say, um, not so great, uh, you know, taunts, you know, hey, big, love that bald head. Yeah, yeah, that's it. There you go. And we're like, a big B or whatever you say in Arabic. Well, she had also lived in the Middle East and she knew some Arabic. So she understood what they were saying. They didn't know she did. But so she turns around and she looks at him and says, Who is your father? What is your family name? Um, uh, uh, or whatever, like this guy said. Ah. And he says, Why do you want to know? And she says, Because you are bringing shame upon your family, and I'm going to tell them how you have brought embarrassment in what you say to other people. And it's like, No, don't do that. <laughs> because you see, your family honor is what drives you, okay? And you hear some of that going on in the scriptures. Uh, that's such a big, broad topic. I'm, I'm kind of just giving you big overviews right now, but we'll get into some specific examples. Okay. So you can hear that in this world, your family tree is everything. How many of you do have done genealogy or know a bunch about your where you're from and? How many of you just, just not, you're in your 
I guess you can't. Okay, not all of us really are. <laughs> not everybody is obsessed with it, but uh, you can see in this world it's a big deal. And uh, you can see why people in other cultures understand why the Old Testament Hebrew Bible seems to be kind of obsessed with the gaps, the gaps it has all the time. And I tell, told one story about when I, um, I got to know a fellow in a, a Hebrew class who's a translator in the Philippines. And uh, they, the first version of Matthew they had written was just a kind of a rough version. And they said, well, you know, we just want to get the gospel. Just skip the, the gaps. And we'll put those in later. And so they left them off. And then in their, their real version of the New Testament, they put them back in. And one of the translation helpers, he, as he was working with them, he said, okay, you mean that this Jesus was a real person? <laughs> they oh. thought he was a magical <laughs> character. <laughs> but, uh, because if he doesn't have any baguettes, then he must not really exist. That tells you how important it is to a lot of other people. Okay. Um, one aspect, of, you know, this is such a familiar trope, we don't even think about the tree, but um, it shows a contrast in the emphasis in our, we say, you know, we think of our family as these nice warm relationships of kids that you know, we grew up with and our family, but it doesn't really define us. The individual is what defines us, you know, our interests and our goals and the like. But in, if you think about a tree, the leaves come out, they're green for a while, yellow, red, and then they die. Each little leaf lives and it dies. The, the tree is what remains. The tree is the permanent thing, not the leaves. And so you're just one little impermanent part of a much more important reality. Along your tree is what defines you. Uh, you guys recognize, do you remember uh, Isaiah 11 talked about the shoot from the stump of Jesse? Okay, and so now you see why the, this picture of the tree, uh, and, and actually there's even, the, they talk about the branch, that's actually a messianic reference, is the branch, the, it's this descendant of David, who, this king who's going to be a mighty king, and he's going to be a great branch on the tree of Israel. That's how we think. And in this world, obviously, your family, when that's what you care about. This is what defines success in life. In our world, what is success? Accomplishment, fame, wealth, riches, glory, Facebook status, whatever, you know, <laughs> success, we know. <laughs> but now when you know about that, then when you pick up the story of Abraham, who is childless, and God promises to make him the father of a great nation, and that he, for 25 years afterwards, they can't have a child, can't have a child. It, it is, it's, in Abraham's mind, it's like, my life will be a waste. This is, it doesn't matter how many servants or camels or anything he has. If he does not have children, his life will be a waste. Right? I should mention, I myself am not married. You'll hear about that a little bit later. I, and so I, I'm not, I don't want to guilt everybody and say you all have to have more babies and love your family more, but you can take that message home, that's fine. But yet, this society where um, your family is what defines you. Those of us from broken families and homes, you can imagine there's a huge amount of shame that, um, that and if you're from a traditional family, you're feeling that a little bit. So I'm not speaking from one who has a huge family. I am part of a bigger family. But you can now um, empathize a little bit more with those <coughs> patriarchs 
when they're you've got Rachel and Rebecca and their child. Uh, I should say I went to actually at SBL at the conference. I went to a talk by a woman who was convinced that the, she's a little on the left side. She, she was convinced that the motif of childbearing, because you know Genesis cursed in childbirth, that women didn't want to get pregnant because it's painful and childbirth is painful, and so it was kind of a blessing to the matriarchs when they only had one childbirth, when they had twins or whatever. And so she's because in her own mind that was a thing to be avoided. That was her own because she's like us, she's very weird, and she's thinking, I better project that on these people and think of them that way. And I can see, you know, you're missing the fact that they did not think like you did. They want big families. In the same way, remember, Adam was cursed by having thorns that make his work of trying to grow a farm very difficult, but he still wants to have a farm. He wants to have a, you know, you have to do that labor. His labor is increased. Her labor is increased. It's it's equal. Okay. Okay. One other kind of surprising thing is you do have some love <coughs> poems. You have Song of Solomon. You've got some passion going on there, but you don't find a prominent theme. Everybody's personal search for a, a great wife or husband. Unlike if you walked into Barnes and Noble, every, the, a big section will be the romance section. And actually pretty much any other section, you go to the mystery section, and it will be a story about the, it will have a side theme about how the, the PI, the, the investigator, this woman, she's obnoxious and she's working on the case and then they cast glances on each other and smoky. <laughs> and they oh, no, <laughs> it's ultimately living happily ever after in romance is what we assume is success in life. Doesn't matter what you do as long as you find a happy partner through romance. And yet you don't have that because marriages were arranged, because this was not something you left up to luck because it was so important. And so you uh, kind of like when you signed up for a job, when you got your first job, you didn't sign up for it because it was your dream job. You signed up because you had to find a job. You had to support your family. In the same way, you need to have babies. You know, they, they're gonna work on the farm. Your parents are, are dependent upon your children. Everybody's dependent upon each other. It's not a matter of, Finding your most wonderful person. Just find somebody. It's fine. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I, I know romance is wonderful. I'm, I'm sure everybody who's married here would give a kiss to your wife or husband right now just to show there you go. It's fine. I'm not trying to not trying to sing it, but notice how this 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 motif that you hear. In the Bible, uh, throughout these stories, the thing that resonated with them was not being able to have children. You keep hearing story after story, and she couldn't have children, and she couldn't have, you can hear why that resonates with them. Okay, so that's just a, okay. So, okay, we, we already introduced ourselves, and so I'm gonna imagine, I used to do this in other classes where I would say, let's introduce ourselves as a biblical person would, and for the sake of time, I'm going to just kind of give you a little sense of how I would do it. Um, okay, the kinds of things that uh, I would do, uh, you would start out maybe saying, I am from the tribe of Levi, you know, or whatever you, and uh, my, in the book of Jonah, <coughs> when, uh, when the Ninevites, or the, the sailors say to him, who are you and where are you from? He says, I am Jonah. Uh, of Israel, and I worship the God who created the heavens and the earth. <coughs> the first thing he says is, I worship so and so. And so you, you mention, you know, because that's your primary identity. Okay? And then, of course, you would mention who you are, your, your children are, 
Okay, how many of you are grandparents? Raise your hand. Any great grandparents here? Okay, how many great grandchildren do you have? Four and two. Okay, you win. You're our great. I, I mean, you get second place, but <laughs> we give you great honor. Okay. And of course, okay, how many great? Any great grandfathers here? Okay, two. Okay, there we go. But you can see this is a different kind of status than in our world, right? Okay. Okay. How many of you are? I'm sorry. This is only for the men. Sorry. Firstborn. Raise your hand. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, and obviously, you know, the father is the <coughs> the crowd. The father represents his family, but it's going to be usually until the man decides differently, the firstborn of his sons who's going to be prepared to take his place is going to be the one who's going to both be the authority to everybody else, and he's also going to represent them. Um, this helped me understand the story of Adam and Eve when, you know, the apple deal is why is it that God God says, because you Listen to your wife when she told you to eat the apple. Uh, what's up with that? You mean men should never wish? It? No, actually, in um, in the story of Abraham and Sarah, God says, "Yeah, you can listen to your wife when she says such and such." So don't worry, that's fine. For you. But Adam is responsible for the decision to be made. He is. He. he has authority over Eve, but he's also responsible to God for what they finally do. So it is him that is at fault. It doesn't matter what she does, it's him who is going to be held accountable. And so that's the logic behind at least this traditional scene, okay? So, okay. And you might also define yourself by some great ancestor who almost, it's almost like he lives forever in his family. There's a point at which when God promises uh, Jacob, <coughs> you know, he keeps reiterating his promise to Abraham, to each of the sons, and to Jacob he actually says, I will cause you to spread forth through your people. You can hear God actually, it's almost like Jacob himself becomes his people, and that's how people thought in terms of their legacy. And so, okay, here You've already heard me say, or he's introduced me as an author and my, my industrial professional role, but this is how I would introduce you to me in Africa, I would say. I am seventh born daughter of Laura and Milk to Berberg, and that's me on that end. Uh, and so I come from a large and prosperous family, so, but, um, and I define myself not just from my, my, my immediate family, but from my greater family. The picture was back in 1950. We have been having family reunions for the past 60 years. And these are my grandpa and grandma. They were missionaries to Madagascar. Here. I come from Spain to Bergberg, <laughs> who proposed to replace <laughs> Elise by saying they, they came to America by themselves on the boat from Norway, and then they met. And when he proposed to her, he said, oh, Indies, would you like to come and serve the Lord with me in Madagascar? <laughs> and so, and she said, oh, dear, 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 dear I would love to serve the Lord. <laughs> we still have the, the letter. So you can see it's pretty strong on tradition in my family. But he's my ancestor, and in some ways, when I talk about myself, I kind of see him living through me and what I do is I'm kind of Bible translator like. But that's not that's not the way I'm doing it in order to understand more biblically what my identity is. I live, he lives on through me. Okay. So, okay. And what you just heard me the way I computed this is that I assume that the children are going to be like their parents 
the apple does not fall far from the tree, like father, like son. And in our world, like, whoa, no way. You never think like this. Do you want to know what you're like? You do, you read the Enneagram book, right? <laughs> or you, you take the MMPI, right? Some kind of psychological test, personality test. You read your Reader's Digest and you answer the questionnaire and you figure out individually your individual loves and pains. Well, a very strong assumption, which is not always true, but you should, this is a good little rule of thumb right in your back, write down in your little rules of thumb, assume that the Bible assumes, if not told otherwise, that the children are going to like their ancestors. In a good way or in a bad way, uh, like, yeah, there are a lot of stories where, uh, like, Ruth, when she approaches Boaz, well, okay, what tribe is Ruth from? Moab. She's a Moabite. Okay. Who is her great ancestor? Lot. Lot, who's, who of course fled from Sodom, and uh, they thought and his daughters approached their father because they thought they were the last people on earth. And so one of their sons was named Moab. Moab. And so, aha, just the way that this, her great, 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 great grandmother approached her father. Look at her and look at this Moabite. She will approach this man because they do that kind of thing. The Moabites, don't you know? This is not a very nice attitude, but it's kind of in the background. Okay. okay. And yet, when you hear about somebody being described as a son of David, David, Jesus is often called son of David, and you're saying, but oh, wait, he's, he's, that's not the name of his dad. You hear... This isn't the, they're not connecting, making that connection the way they are. He's a descendant of David, but it means that he's like his father. He's a great king. And you should be reading his story with shadows of his ancestors. He might modify the story, but that's a very strong thing going on in the background. And so you hear Jesus say to uh, his in a sermon, he says, be sons of your father in heaven who or, or he gives rain to both the just and the unjust. He, and he causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And I used to think that the, the sun was the happy thing and the rain was a, the sad thing and we don't like rainy days. Well, in the Middle East, the rain day, rainy days are when people cheer because their crops are going to grow. But the point being is when you are sons, it means that you need to develop the character and imitate your loving father. So that's the point. You need to understand this assumption or get that. Yes? So, uh -huh. John 3, mm -hmm. 10, I think. Mm -hmm. um, God gives those who believe in Jesus the right to become children of God. Mm -hmm. Is that that same thing? Uh, yes. Hold that thought just for one moment. <laughs> you're so close. That's perfect. Yes, you're you're just once you're just merging right in. Okay. Yes. And so that's exactly um give me one more slide after this one, but <laughs> that's good. Um so one thing that we Christians kind of struggle with is all that extra New Testament stuff that we because we tend to read well it's all about you know the sin and the fall and then skip when we come to New Testament Jesus is born and yet the, there's this incredibly prominent theme of the family of Abraham and God has <coughs> made a promise to Abraham and how is he actually going to find fulfill it that's the tension going on and how, that's how your ancient reader okay maybe they didn't read so it's your hearer that's just like childbirth, and then I'm going to have children. That's what would have resonated with them. <coughs> Hearing how God was continually blessing and using that family was what they cared about. And so that's God's, the plot is God's promise to Abraham. 
And we'd say, oh yeah, that was just in the Old Testament. <laughs> but what about the New Testament? It's still there and it's very strong actually. In the New Testament, we have all these conversations going on in Jesus where it's who's the son of Abraham? Not meaning just who genetically is, but who's a faithful person who's like Abraham. Okay. You have this, Jesus has this argument with uh, some teachers of the law who who say um, uh, they say we do not know who your father is. You know, if we knew who you were, we would know. Uh, and uh, Jesus says, we'll see. Um, okay, Jesus says to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth as a come from God. Um, but you are of your father, the devil. You know, and obviously they're not literally of their of, but that's what he means. Okay, and in some sense, there's a little bit of a sense of, we wonder where the salvation motifs are, or talking about who's saved and who's not saved. It's, there's a little of that hinting in the background. Who is part of the faithful tribe of Israel that will be saved, and who are the ones who are going to be left out in the end? Okay, and it it comes up. It becomes a theme in Paul, and we tend to the traditional way of reading Paul is that his attitudes towards the law are they're about legalism and earning your way to salvation. But a lot of times what he's talking about is the fact that the Jewish people, the Lord made this wonderful covenant with our family. And he gave us this wonderful Torah that will teach us how to live. And, and how can you have life in the world to come if you have not become a faithful abiding law, you know, law fulfilling member of our family. And so Paul, uh, we're going to, that actually is what he is often responding to is how could God love and save the Gentiles? Maybe you've heard the word goyim. That's, that, that's, it literally means nation. Um, Nations, the, the and and of course that's what in Yiddish or whatever that's what people use the word, and in the in the New Testament you see Paul often talking about the ethne in Greek that means nation, but he's very specifically talking about people, and sometimes it has this edge of those heathens, those pagans. Remember Jesus saying, "Do not go on, do not pray on and on like the pagans who think they're babbling." That's ethne, going a little edge of, and so it's just stunning how on earth these there are enemies. They worship rocks and they oppress <laughs> us. They try to kill us if we don't like them, and they hate us too. And how on earth can God love them? And it's just the shock that the Lord. That's kind of grace on a big national scale. That is, if you live there where everything's about your family. Your soba and your family is the only good people on earth. It is impossible to think that the people who hate you somehow got to love them too. That's a big part of what's going on. And so mm. this will also help you understand Romans. Recognize that you can see this tree for some strange reason it has these flowers that are only growing on this part because they are grafted. It's a grafted branch on there. Amazingly, a grafted in branch will keep growing the way it ever has been. And then Paul talks about his God's shocking grace that he would cut off branches in order to bring in these enemies of his people. And he talks about how this, he himself, he would rather be damned to see any of him, his people lost, and yet God's incredible grace that he would bring in these enemies of his people. It, what struck me, this a little bit graphic, avert your gaze, 
Imagine. This is like a body. You're like, I'm going to cut off my finger in order to save you. You know, <laughs> this is like grandma and grandpa. And that's, you know, I love my grandma and grandpa. I'll cut them off for my family for your sake. Put you in. Imagine, you can feel the pain there when you imagine that it's a personal loss to lose your, your precious family members. And of course, it's their own choice. They reject Christ and they are not responding in faith when God sends his Messiah, right? And so you can see why, yes, I can see that. But yet, so there's a pain involved, like a sacrifice almost, in the same way that Jesus sacrificed us, himself for us. Israel sacrifices some of its family members so that we can join that family, so that we can become sons of our Father in heaven, okay? And so we're going to probably pull us together, give us a little break, but let's I'll give you a bunch of homework to sit there and rethink about what does this mean? What, it, what I've described in terms of that motif of becoming sons of God, this adoption in God's family, where his family really means his believers. In some sense, there's kind of a sense of only God's true children of Abraham are the safe people. It's different than our individualistic salvation is, here's my list of sins in Jesus. Definitely there's the atonement we paid for my sins. But yet, there's, this is a different way of looking at it, and it's very much more Hebraic. Here it is, you are the body of Christ. Remember we were talking about how when in a room like this, if I said, is it hot in here? And all of you Europeans, would, Americans and Europeans would say, yes, I think it's hot. But if you're non-Western, You'd be saying, I'm waiting for my representative of my family to say so. And so when somebody who's non-Western actually puts his hand up, he's speaking for 50 people in the room. And so this idea of one person representing the rest applies to when we're talking about you're part of the body of Christ. Jesus represents you, of course, his holiness. I bet you're hearing all these verses right here. Think about that. You are God's temple. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that um, we tend to read it as my body is a temple. And so that means I uh, I need to do some more UV blocking sun lotion <laughs> and more vegetables because my body is a temple. How many temples Pagan gods have lots and lots of temples, but Bill God only has one, and so we have to all be blocks and rocks and uh, carved stone in a one big temple. Okay, and then the most obvious motif that just is what struck me: Wow, I never. These keep talking about the kingdom of God, so we keep talking about me personally getting saved, and he keeps talking about God redeeming us. And God's redemptive act on the part of his whole family. Not to, I, one thing that I find that I have a problem with is as soon as we talk about we, I go brain dead. I'm like, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, I'll read my Facebook. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're part of a corporation and your CEO of your company says, we're going to move over into this direction, we're going to be doing this, you start sweating. Because that means my job is going to change. I have to respond to this. And it's not just a pastor in front of an audience where they're like, he's giving another sermon and I don't care because it doesn't apply to me. I'm just an audience. There's a difference between it applies to me. It's my job. I'm part of this company and I have to do what he tells me to. And so um, as I thought about this idea of Christ is our, <laughs> our Savior, not just my personal savior, but our savior. Uh, I love this. One person came up to me and he, he said, it's like a mosaic. Each one of us is a little part of the picture of Jesus' image on earth. That's how it's very, 
and that together, each one of us can reflect a little bit of it, but we all come together on some of this beautiful, beautiful picture of Christ uh, is, uh, presents itself. So we are his kingdom. We're his servants. His, we, he represents us and we do what he tells us. <laughs> Not because he's heavy handed, but he is our our you name it. He uh, he he does <coughs> far more than anything we can ever imagine. So my question for you as we have a little bit of break here is to ask what does it mean to <coughs> think as a week? Okay. All right, thank you. You are like a mind reader. Now, they can also go on the website. Some of them are tech, tech centers, <laughs> and and there's a place there like they have on yeah. the sign yeah. up. Is that right? Yeah. But uh, if you're see that net, if you want to see the oldest website on the internet, it will make you laugh. All comic songs. It's a terrible goofy font, and everything is mismatched and screwed up. It's still up there. You can look at me and my former days. So, okay. so I have to laugh. We'll see how the how the this is going to be with the Lord's help. If He can help us uh, tackle a, a subject that has been on my mind for a long. It took me a year to write a chapter. That's why I don't get my books out very fast. <laughs> because I uh, and the big question on my mind was what I I, I named the chapter <laughs> called Greek Brain, Hebrew Brain. Okay, do you remember? And uh, we're talking about once again non Western versus Western thought. But I think you'll start <laughs> understanding some of our big disconnect. And I start with a story from Ken Bailey. How many people have heard of Ken Bailey? Okay, yeah, at TEI, yeah, he's telling you about these good scholars. He has been writing books on Jesus through Mediterranean eyes. Um, Ken Bailey got his PhD in systematic theology, very highly educated pastor. He went to, I'm not sure, somewhere in a, a radio and he worked among <laughs> them. And uh, what he tells in reflection is that <coughs> when he first emerged from his advanced program of study, if you would have asked him and in an absolutely unguarded moment what he thought of Jesus compared to what he thought of Paul, he would have said that he loved Paul's brilliant, sophisticated, rhetorical argumentation. But Jesus just couldn't. Jesus was a little spacey. And he told stories for the kids, telling about fishermen and losing tiny pearls and these silly little parables. Where is the elegant? argumentation that he had worked so hard on for all these years, he just can't resonate with why, okay, yes, Jesus is the Savior and the Son of God, but why is he just... <laughs> I'm not the one who thought this up, he said this. And then he went to the Middle East and he said, you know what, it's because Jesus communicated in a different way and he was incredibly sophisticated. But he's speaking a different cultural language. And once he started learning it, all of a sudden his respect just grew and grew. He says, no, Jesus is the major scholar of the New Testament. Paul was good. Jesus is. And my Jewish scholars, when they read Jesus, um, one of the major, my favorite sources, uh, and this is not because he's interactive. He, he died many years ago, but... He had not spent a lot of time interacting with Christianity at all. But whereas we tend to read the works of Paul as 
especially if we're theologians, that's where we spend all our time. He says, Paul was kind of a lightweight in terms of rabbinic scholarship. Jesus was the heavyweight with the scholarship. Wow. Hmm. Where could, where, where? So that's what my, my struggle or my thought for us tonight. How can we understand Jesus' way of teaching a little better? Okay. And this is the way I put it is, why doesn't Jesus and the Bible speak more theologically? You know, they wouldn't get invited to speak at TEI, the <laughs> theological, because we just don't use those words. We, when we talk about theology, we tend to speak about God, and we discuss our definitions of his attributes. Here, let me see if you know a few. What, what kind of things do you think of? I'm changing. Okay, yes. Change. What other? Omniscience. Omniscience. Thank you. There we go. We've got omniscience. Omnipotence. Omnipotence. See? Here we're feeling, we're discussing God now. We're talking about, and here's the $7 word for unchangingness, immutability. He's unchanging. He's immutable. Let's, we can write a few books on that one. Eternality. He is without end. That's how we think. Okay, he has no beginning, no end. I am, and you can pin that on scripture. I am the Alpha, the Omega. It's right in there. But we use concepts and definitions in our, in our, as our main focus. Whereas the Bible itself says things about God in concrete images. The shepherd of Israel. You know, the king of eternity speaks of, he calls himself, I am the rock of Israel. Uh, you have left the, uh, abandoned the springs of living water and, and drunk from empty cisterns. I am those, what on earth? You feel how... I can't talk theologically with these vague, weird right? <laughs> Very frustrating. Frustrating. You feel like they're, it, especially when one part of our, and I'm just going to label this whole mindset Greek, even though don't, don't think that that's very wooden and there was some interplay and certainly there's some of that going on on the rabbis in the New Testament. It's not hundred percent, but yet Greek, Greeks tend to be condescending. There's a little bit of a, in the same way as the Goyim, the pagans, the heathens are kind of lower class. Actually, you see a lot of that in, um, in tribal cultures. We love each other, we hate everybody else. That's kind of not the best attitude, but it's there. And with the Greeks, you had the Greeks and the Barbarians, you know that word, and it comes from supposedly bar 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 bar. It's like a, a sheep going boo boo boo. You can't you, you can't even make sounds, and if you're not Greek and you can't speak with definitions, and you think you're a bloody idiot, right? And so that's kind of the this condescending cultural attitude that I think any of us know when you open up something and you see something full of pictures, you say it's written for the kids, isn't it? And it's not for us adults. It's for the kids. And yet, that's how the Bible talks about God. Like, it must be written for the kids. Well, let's look at it a little bit more. And so, this is what Ken Bailey talks about is a big disconnect is Westerners communicate in abstract concepts. That's how we put the big discoveries, you know, our, our main point is going to be to, is when we focus in on the concepts. Whereas Easterners will communicate in concrete images. Okay, so here, okay, put your, 
put your thinking brain on and listen to me feel sophisticated as we, this is us talking in our, our sophisticated way. Listen, objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to commensurate with any capacity to provide a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. You feel all that abstraction there? Lots of abstractions. Okay, we're back. We got phenomena. What's a phenomena? I can't point at it. What's a phenomena? <laughs> feel that sophistication there? But it is. <coughs> okay. Let's, uh, here's a way that you could, this is how you might read it in the Bible in concrete images. Listen to the same thing coming in seven pictures. In Ecclesiastes, it says, Again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, or bread to the wise, or riches to the discerning, or favor to the skillful. Rather, time and chance happen to all of them. You can see there's great wisdom there. They didn't collapse it down into definitions. They used concrete metaphors in some sense in order to, to say the same big thing. <coughs> you know, when you say under the sun, it means observable phenomena, but it's said in a much more concrete way. Um, bread to the wise. Yeah, we were talking about give us your daily bread. That's in Hebrew, lahem, bread means food. It's kind of all they eat a lot of the time. But lahem, food. When you when Jesus uh, gives thanks for the bread, he is thanking God for all sustenance. But and so that one word it stands for all sustenance, right? Okay. This is what's called a metonym. Oh, that was nice. That's a definition. <laughs> but you can write that one down. A metonym is when you take a one word to apply over a whole wider context. You speak of the White House. I'm just that sound I'm just talking about you might say I'm only talking about a building in Washington, DC, but I'm not. I'm talking about Trump or whatever. You know, I mean, I a whole, the White House has a bigger uh, connotation. In the same way, this is part of what they were doing in the non-Western world, is they tend to speak in terms of pictures and how they use these concrete images in order to express truth. So that's, I think, not that hard for us to understand. Um, God is, is a rock of Israel. You could say that's because of his reliability, his durability, his eternality. So we're, we're converting that concrete image into abstract concepts, which we kind of resonate more with. Okay. Here's, a, here's another pictorial phrase. The pen is mightier than the sword. What does that mean? I do. Okay. Okay. Killing people. Yeah, okay, there you go. And <laughs> I think it's often in reference to the printing press or the writing. You know, instead of just attacking the neighbor down your street who makes you crazy, you write an editorial in the newspaper and you, and that will be more, okay. So I looked up this on Wikipedia. This is what they said. It is a metonymic <laughs> adage. <laughs> Proverbs, right? Sounds like Proverbs. 
that's a very Eastern way of thinking about this. Okay. Okay, here is another image. And listen to these words. It's from Isaiah 53. It says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lion to the slaughter, and his sheep before the shearers was silent, so he did not open his mouth. And his sheep, very concrete, very vague. You know, you could say, well, why don't you use propitiation <laughs> and substitutionary atonement? I mean, those are very useful, very narrowly defined good words to describe big ideas. And yet, in the New Testament, you'll hear Jesus being referred to as the Lamb of God over and over and over again. And they're speaking of Isaiah 53. And why, are, why they keep doing that, there are some advantages of this concreteness compared to definitions. Images are emotional, right? You can feel the outrage. How dare that poor little life <coughs> is guilty. I hate to see this horrible thought that you can think of the suffering of Christ. It's emotional. Okay? It's complex. There's all of this mystery. I don't know why that little lamb was chosen. And you're, you're feeling uh, that's what you should be feeling, right? Paradoxical. And if you're a Greek and you need everything to line up logically, this will make you crazy, right? <laughs> right? That does it. Okay. Think back to what I just said. The pen is mightier than the sword. And what it means is the printing press, whatever, the writing articles in journalism is more important than are more effective than bombs and shooting people. But when you, if you reduce it down to this image of the pen, <coughs> and they're really, this is an old, old thing, so like the quill pen is mightier than the sword. It's absurd. That's a paradox. It's impossible. And so to the Greek thinkers who like to line up things in definition, it makes them crazy because you can't do a proof on um, the pen is mightier than the sword. It's upside down. You can't say pen. No, no, no. Pens are not mightier than swords. That's wrong. Because it doesn't, you're not trying to prove something. It's a statement about a reality. And that's the way images are often are. Okay? And, and I would say this is more important than anything else. You write this in your notes. The most important thing, the part about the images that <coughs> Jesus is using is they're not just vague metaphors. They're not just happy lambs. They're not just fluffy little animals. They, it, the reason they're important is because they evoke memories. The pen is not about any old pen. It's talking about the printing press and it's thinking, it's thinking back in history. When you think of, when you read Isaiah and you see to talk about the sheep. What do you think the ancient Israelites might have been thinking about? Atonement, bringing their own little sheep up to pay for their sins. Uh -huh. Anything else? Passover lambs. Passover lambs. Uh, yes, the thing that they paint over their doorpost in order to. Uh, to celebrate God's redemption of them from Egypt. Anything else? Food. Food. Actually, don't forget that it's that one thing we tend to over, we have, we're, we're so unused to sacrifices, we tend to over <coughs> sin. Oh, sin. 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 Well, it's death and suffering. And they're like, oh, love the lamb. And, you know, when it's a celebration, mm, and so that is over. Okay. Uh, what other? Okay, I, I, I won't push you too far. How about Abraham and Isaac? Where Isaac says, "Father, we have the knife and we have the wood, but there is the lamb." Father, 
will provide the lamb, my son. <laughs> you feel all the tension there. And this is a really important, when you're reading these imager, images in the, that Jesus is using, actually throughout the Bible, it is assuming you have a memory of the culture. One thing, when we open up the Bible, we read that little passage, and we assume it's all self-contained. The Bible is incredibly self-referential. It make, make you crazy. It assumes you've read it already. <laughs> it's reflecting and reflecting and reflecting. And so put that, so there's this classic adage among the rabbis, they would say, turn it and turn it and turn it again. And you keep reading the you get it on one level and you get some of the truths and then the time next time you read it you see more connections another way they say is it's like listen to me concrete images here it's it's like <coughs> drops of rain first they drip slowly and then they start trickling and the trickling flows into a stream and it becomes a mighty rushing river that's what it's like with knowledge of the Torah when you start reading it over and over. Oops, I'm talking in concrete images again, I'm sorry. So, but you have to know, okay. This is what got me fascinated, but I want to spend just a little time. Why is it that our culture doesn't think like this? We can thank the ancient Greek philosophers, Plato. I'm going to try to do this without too many polyphilomists. What caused this split? And it was about four or five hundred years before Christ that you started hearing people talk a different way. And I tried, if you want to use the big word, it's abstract rationalism. And this is what I, this is the way I call, put it in my book. I called it, the Greeks invented a new operating system. Just like you update your iPhone, and all of a sudden the screen is completely different. It does everything a different way. And I call it thinking 2.0. And they invented this great idea. And what they said was they came up with this new way of thinking about thinking itself. Simplifying reality, isolating abstract attributes, and discovering universal laws. Thank you. Let me hear it. Okay. Here's one, it's almost straight from Plato. Look, look at this lovely table here. It's a, there are the gazillion, there are many, many tables in the world that are like it, but they're not the same thing. It's not identical. We don't talk, it, it, and how much better it is instead of thinking <laughs> of just this one concrete table to think of the ideal, abstract idea of the table. You say, how helpful is that? Well, because it can tell us about every table that has ever existed. This table is going to break in 20 years. They're going to say, let's throw it out, get a new one. This one is just going to perish in a But that ideal table would be wonderful. And so let's invent the concept of, I call it tableness, the idea of tableness. And then once you start doing that, let's talk about. It's made out of wood. See, there's this laminate. Let's think about woodenness. Let's think about materiality. Let's think about the concepts behind the existence of this table. And you see, all of a sudden, you can shift into this whole new zone of thinking that you never could before when you're really talking about tables. Yes. Yes. So, how difficult do you think it was then? Um, for the people who wrote the Septuagint to do that and to try to, to try to. What's, great, great question. I'm going to save that one. That's a great question. Septuagint, of course, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. I will say one comment is one thing you hear over and over from Bible translators in indigenous cultures is they say the Old Testament is very easy to translate, the New Testament is really difficult because it keeps talking in these abstract concepts that you don't find in the Old Testament. And so one, now I'll say this, I better not, I, I can tell you more stories, but we'll, so anyhow, and so all I can tell you of my stories from my science world is that 
uh, what we do with these wonderful concepts that we've discovered about our tables and materiality and existence we, is then we take all of our truths. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's a syllogism. If you know this truth, then you can put this in the category, and then you think, oh, we can build and build and build and build. If God is omniscient and he's omnipotent that shows that he will be you know this is where we start with theology and that's where it all comes from build ideas on ideas and we build skyscrapers and that's what we do okay that's, and if you're doing this in the world of like of rectangles you looked at your table and you said oh i can talk about rectangles let's think about rectangles move into geometry if you're pythagoras you can say wow the length of the two sides squared added together equals the length of the hypotenuse. And it always, 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 always does. And wow, you can't believe how excited mathematicians get about that. <laughs> they love that. And so you can see there's, there's incredible excitement over this new way of defining reality. And so everything is much cooler if you can talk about it abstractly. You shift towards abstraction. Linear argumentation, precise definitions. It's, it's, it's like playing a game of Jenga where everything is stacked on top of each other, right? There's a, that's how you. And so, when your great thinkers approach the Bible, they say, "Let's write a systematic theology of that, where we reduce it to abstractions." And we don't talk about the God of Israel. We talk about the concept of monotheism. The word monotheism isn't anywhere. And in fact, it talks about, you shall have no other gods before me. And it doesn't seem, this doesn't seem to really be a thing on their mind, and yet it's what we derive out of it. I can show you many places where it says there is no God, but God alone. And so it's not that that's not true, but we're kind of so obsessed with fitting it into ideas that uh, what does it do? What other things might it be saying? Right? And that's how we define ourselves with this theology of beliefs. And so this is, I think, in Greek, it's part of the Apostles' Creed. And so that's how I define myself at church, the way I grew up. You know, we believe. What do you believe? Right? You know, I believe. And so, <laughs> right. So now I bet you're. I'm guessing you probably feel at home with this, and I bet you might resonate with the question I started wondering about Jesus' Jewish context is, okay, if they don't talk like this, what did you see? How do they define their creed? Could, in my first class with Ray Banner one, I said, could somebody please give me a copy of their creed? What's the creed? That will define that. What's their beliefs? But every one of you wishes you could just tell me, could you just tell me their creed? What's their belief? Because that's how we do it. And uh, when he handed out a copy of the Shema, mm -hmm. which functions that way, okay. Um, it says Shema Israel. And uh, what does that mean? Israel. Israel. How many of you, when I say the Shema, does that mean anything to you? Raise your hand. How many of you have never heard of such a thing? Okay, so honestly, I'm like, what are you talking about? That's my usual, most Christian, I don't know. But if you've started studying, you've heard. When we say the Lord's Prayer, everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. The Shema is uh, a central, it's, I wouldn't say it's a prayer, it's what, but every Jewish person, every morning, every evening of their life, it is supposed to be the very last words in your in your mouth when you die. And in fact, it's in the gas chambers in Auschwitz, you would hear people <coughs> say the Shema on their way to die. And actually, when children are, um, when they're just learning to talk, their parents will make sure it is the very first thing that comes out of their mouth. They learn the Shema before any other words. And it means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart and soul and your life. 
that when Jesus was asked, what was the greatest commandment? He says that. You can see it's pretty important to him too. Okay. So, okay, I can live with that, and it's kind of theological about God. I can work with that. After your, that part, there's another section of it, and this is what blew my mind. The next section says, so if you faithfully obey me, let's see, okay, I will provide grass in the field for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. I will provide grain, new wine, and oil, and you will eat and drink your fill. And I, I'm just going to go but it's like, why are there, why are there barnyard animals in their tree? I was like, that's not, right? It doesn't make any sense. We've moved out of concepts and truths, and we're now in barnyard animals. It makes no sense to me. Until, okay, I got it. Until. I started realizing the context. Ah, look at the context of where is the Shema coming from. The Shema is not a, a statement of isolated beliefs. It's actually a recollection of an event. It is the recollection of the covenant on Mount Sinai, where all of Israel, all their fathers and their ancestors who they still love and they get their identity from promised God for eternity we will love and serve you alone and so when you're seeing in the morning in the evening Shema Israel you're <coughs> making a pledge I will love you with all my heart and soul and strength doesn't that seem fitting and it's a very different way of looking at life in terms of defining the things you believe no, you're reminding yourself of this promise and you're, you're remembering through your ancestors your commitment to serve the God you believe in. Okay? So, so uh, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus and the disciples come upon this man who's been born blind. And the disciples' question seems very Jewish, especially in light of what you just said. Mm -hmm. Who sinned? This man or his parents, and yeah. he was born blind. Okay, sure. And Jesus' response was, nobody sinned. He was born this way so God could be born. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> he doesn't give you a theological. He gives a, yeah, it's, he's down to earth. He's not giving you theological definitions. Is that what you're talking about? Let's, let's keep going. We'll be there. Okay, we'll keep going. That's okay. We're thinking together. Okay. So, as we've said, among the, at TEI, when you're studying apologetics or whatever, you are asking the question, when you're defending your faith, you're saying, is this reasonable? Does this accord with human logic? That's how we defend ourselves, right? Can it be proven? Yeah. And the person we love the most is C.S. Lewis, and I love him too. <laughs> He's so great. And so you read his thing about Jesus a liar when he claims to be the son of God, or is he a lunatic? And if he's neither a liar and neither a lunatic, he must be the Lord. And that's great, and praise God, that is really, really good. I, I, yes, and, <laughs> and, and it, it meets the need that our culture has. And yet, how in the world of the Bible <clears throat> would they answer the question? And what they are interested in is not the reason as much as our, their experience. Is this in our tradition? Is this part of our family's memory? You know, because your memory, is, your family is the source of your identity and everything. Do our fathers know about this? You remember Greeks seek wisdom? And you seek signs, you know, did their prophets prophesy about this? That's what appealed to an Easter thing. Is it in our scripture? I told you memory is very important. And so in the Eastern world, people 
much, much more aware of their scriptures. So, okay. Memory is what is going on here. And, okay. Now, we're going to bring it together <coughs> in a few minutes. And I want to show you where Jesus kind of says the gospel in an Eastern way. And uh, relate it back to the big push line of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible in a Hebrew way. Okay. 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 And so what the Lord says to them many, many times through their history is you shall remember. It's not so much about I'm going to prove this to you rationally. It's you shall remember this. You think about it as the Greeks are trying to summarize all of human experience and they're trying to imagine their ideas about what's reasonable for what a God should be like. And so, whereas the Israelites are saying, we experience this strange being who presented himself as a fire on the mountain. And he said, don't make anything that looks like me. God kind of rejects all, don't try to define me as a golden calf. Don't try to define you this way. In some ways, he just refuses to be defined. And instead, what he says is, remember what I've done. I will be what I will be. And that's how God defines himself, is through. And so, okay, here's a quiz question. What's the most important event in the New Testament? Resurrection. Good. Okay, next hard, harder question. What's the most important event in the Old Testament? Passover. I heard creation. Passover. They're all. They're all. It's all the same thing. Oh, that's nice. That's good. Okay. Okay. Here, I'll, I'll redefine my question. What event is recalled and discussed in almost every single book of the Old Testament. Exodus. It is the Exodus is the defining event of Israel's history. It is the, and so and and okay and so what you find in the feasts of Israel, how many of you read a little more about the feasts? Not everybody's had <laughs> God gives them all these things and and that's very strong on this is remember what I have done for you when I brought you out of Egypt. Remember this day when I came out of Egypt, the house of slavery for the strong hand I brought you out of this place. Okay, and and he gives them instructions on how to celebrate over and over and over and over. Okay, on Passover, we're gonna pretend like we're eating our very last meal. We're gonna pretend just like it's that night. Everybody remember what it was like that. And then for a week, we're going to all eat unleavened bread just like that. The, the bread that you couldn't even let it rise. Remember, it's like you teach your children this. And people like that because it's fun for the kids. But it, it's to remember, make the adults remember. Okay? And the next feast, there's one that's called Sukkot. You live in booths. That's to help you remember how you're, you. Your ancestors were in the desert and God was faithful to them for 40 years. You're just supposed to grain it into your brain and your life is this is what the Lord has done for us. That's how we define ourselves. Okay? And then when God starts giving them commands and <coughs> laws, many of them are come out of this divine experience. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. It's a house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. They're dependent upon that memory. That's how it's okay. And in fact, many of God's commands, in some ways, the word zahar, zahar, Remember, we think of a thing happening only in our brains, but I always point out Genesis 8, where Noah is out floating in his ark on 
the waters and it says, and God remembered Noah and sent a wind to dry up. And you know, it sounds like God's like, <laughs> because we think of remembering as a mental activity. <laughs> we can to remember Hebraically is to act on your memory, to commemorate it, to celebrate it, and to live it out. And so there's a lot of there are many commands that are hinged on if you remember what I did for you, you have to do that for others. And you'll hear um, it says because you were an alien in Egypt. You shall have mercy. You shall love the Egyptian, you know, the, the alien like yourself, because you were aliens in Egypt. Remember what you went through, and be gracious in that same way. Um, it says, you shall let your servants and your animals and your laborers celebrate the Sabbath. And I used to, I, everybody I've ever. The Sabbath is just a list of commandments about going to the church. No, it's to teach them that just as God has set them free from slavery and released them to rest, they have to allow other, their, all of their servants to rest at least one day. Okay? And you hear that same motif. <coughs> Every seven years, you must set your the debtors free. <laughs> because God set you free. And then in a year of Jubilee, every seventh day, every seventh year, every seven, seven years, God is get this into your brain is you have to live out what I've done for you, you must do for others. Very strong. And it's something I never noticed it until you look at how it relates back Okay, yes. and so now, yeah, like, if you to Jesus, would you please? Okay, sorry. This is, remember, Jesus, on his last night, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And he is celebrating Passover, which recalls the redemption from Egypt, right? And, and he calls it a new covenant. I won't even go in. I could for three years on all of the imagery here, so we won't do that, but he holds up the cup of redemption, which is it's all about God, the lamb protecting Israel, and all of these motifs, and he says this cup is a new cup of my blood. <laughs> There's these images of Isaiah 53, is this one who uh, he takes their sins upon them, and he atones and pays just the classic gospel you always heard. And he extends this and he says, celebrate my redemption of you every, well, uh, every time you meet together. That's what he says. He's recalling once again that concrete image of the Lamb of Passover and uh, go beyond those evocative memories that we all have and bringing you back again. Isaiah 53, because you remember this. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned in his own way, and the Lord has laid on him. <laughs> and so, and he, much of his preaching ministry is about saying, in the way that you have been forgiven, you have to forgive others. If God has shown mercy to you, you go show mercy to others. It's contingent on share your redemption make disciples as i have shown you god's love you go do that for others you see how isn't that fun how it all comes together when you think more eastern you think in terms of how can we make real this event that defines us it's you know creeds are really good and important when you know the early church was involved in all these heresies and controversies and you need creeds sometimes in order to just define the ins and the outs it's important <laughs> and yet creeds are kind of cold right and impersonal and they just they make your brain think a while but they don't they don't inflame your passions 
to love the world like we're calling Christ at a final meal, saying, this is my new covenant. You are my people. I have brought you into the love of God, and I've brought forgiveness to your sins. Now go show this to everybody else. So that's what's wonderful about the Eastern way of thinking. Whoops, we're not doing it for you. We're going to do it for so praise the Lord, that's the end. And look, I'm pretty close to the All right, we'll wrap up uh, pretty quickly. How about a blessing or two or three that you may have that uh, you'd just like to say, hey, well, it's appreciate the way that uh, your work and ministry has helped. I hope I never forget that. Image that you gave 